I just want to say welcome um, to our program today on integrated pest management and asbestos management in school facilities. Today, we have two presentations um, focused on subject areas that are important for environmental health in school buildings. My name is Bethany Olson. I work with the EPA. I'm in the Region 7 office in the pesticide program. I have the pleasure of getting us started today. I mean, first, just wanted to say a quick thank you um, to all of you for joining us. Before we get started, um, I do have a few quick notes about today's presentation. Um, I first wanted to turn it over to Richard Jones from the Missouri School Plant Managers Association to talk about certification credits. Richard? Thank you. Good morning to all who have signed in. It looks like we've got 44 that have presently signed in, but I know that number represents more. And the reason I say that, for those of you that are in an office and you have some of your associates with you, we will not have record of their attendees. I need everyone to provide me with an email to give proper documentation for those that have not been able to sign in. So if you're in a school district that uh, you're in an office, you've signed in and you've got two people sitting beside you listening in on this presentation, please provide me with an email with their names so I can document their training accordingly. Then when we meet in, Saint in Chesterfield on the 21st, I will have a record of your attendance with me. If I've missed something, we can cover it at that time and make necessary corrections. Again, welcome to module three virtual training. And we would like to thank our special presenters, uh, Carabelle and Bethany Olson. And uh, these other gentlemen, oh, we have a special guest. Uh, I was very pleased to hear a gentleman from Alaska who will be introducing himself later. I think this is a first, this is great. Uh, that's all I have at this time. So thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. As I mentioned earlier, um, as we go through our presentations today, um, we encourage you to submit questions. We will be using the um, question box down at the bottom of your screen um, to receive questions. So those can be about the presentation, um, or if you're having any technical difficulties, um, you can let us know there too, um, and we'll be responding to those um, as we go through. We will also have um, PDF available of the slides um, after the webinar. You can look for that later on. And as Richard um, mentioned today, um, we do have a team of EPA folks here um, who will be speaking to um, the integrated pest management and asbestos parts of our program. So Marie and I will be starting off um, today on IPM. And then Kara, John, and Tyler uh, will be doing the second half of our presentation on asbestos. So um, I think folks will be introducing themselves as we go through to learn a little bit more um, about what each of us do here at EPA. So this time, I'll go ahead and jump into the integrated pest management part of our program. As I said, my name is Bethany Olson. I work at EPA Region 7, which is the EPA regional office serving Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, and Nebraska. In my role, um, I get to help provide outreach and education on integrated pest management for schools, daycares, and hospitals, um, and other types of public facilities. You know, we talked a little bit about in the beginning, um, the number of facilities that participate um, in this program, and just really excited to be here with you all um, due to the number of children that attend um, public schools in Missouri. I did some research that there's nearly 900,000 students um, that spend a significant portion of their day um, in over 2,300 public school buildings in Missouri. And IPM provides an excellent opportunity to create safer learning environments to reduce children's exposure to pests and pesticides in schools. So pests are not only a nuisance, 
but can also be a public health concern. Some of the concerns that we commonly hear about um, with pests and pesticides in schools include sanitation, since common kitchen pests, such as cockroaches, mice, ants, and flies um, can cause sanitation issues, contaminate food, um, and spread pathogens. Building damage can be the result um, of a number of things, including rats chewing on electrical wires, um, which can be an electrical danger and a fire hazard. Uh, mold and termites can damage the structural integrity of a building. Staff and parents often get upset when they see pests um, in facilities, and often um, they want them to get rid of them as quickly as possible, which sometimes can lead to the overuse or incorrect use of pesticides. We're going to be talking a bit, quite a bit about pesticides today. Um, I would note that you know we're talking about both indoor and outdoor pesticides, um, which in school buildings um, can be herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides, um, and even antimicrobial pesticides, such as disinfectants, um, which we'll be talking about briefly towards the end of my presentation. Um, but through their very nature, um, all of those different types of products um, pose some risks, and due to their biology and behavior, um, children are often especially at risk for pesticide exposure. And finally, allergies and asthma um, is a concern with both pests and pesticides. Some rodents, cockroaches, and dust mites um, can be present in buildings um, and can cause or inflame serious allergic reactions um, and asthma attacks. Likewise, the chemicals used um, to combat these pests can also be asthma triggers. And most recent statistics show um, that about one in 10 children in Missouri currently has asthma. So what is integrated pest management? Um, you know, this is likely a review for many of you, um, but we like to think about IPM um, as this pyramid. So the base of the pyramid um, of an effective IPM plan um, is always education and communication. So having good communication between school administration, facilities managers, custodial staff, teachers, and even students is important um, in order to create a team approach to pest management issues. If you contract out pest control services, uh, you also want to have good communication with pest management professionals, um, as well as a good contract. The next tier there, um, cultural and sanitation practices. These tactics can include cleaning hard to reach areas and maintaining clutter free environments. You want to keep in mind that, like humans, um, pests also need three things to survive, food, water, and shelter. So the goal of IPM is to deny pests of those things um, in order to not attract pests in the first place, um, but also to achieve more success when we're trying to control them. So by eliminating these conditions, we can reduce pest issues significantly. Physical and mechanical control means excluding pests from buildings, for example, maybe by sealing cracks and crevices that allow pest entry. And then finally, um, at the top there, you can see that IPM is not a no pesticides approach, um, but encourages the use of um, monitoring and inspections, as well as record keeping to determine if, when, and where pesticide treatments um, might be needed. So by utilizing all of these different tools, um, we can reduce the number of unnecessary pesticide applications and also achieve longer term solutions. Okay, so what does this actually look like in schools? Um, so I have a, 
the rest of my presentation, uh, there's going to be it's kind of a ton of photos um, that I'll quick click through um, a little bit faster because I think a lot of them are self-explanatory. Um, I kind of wanted to show some examples of how um, schools around the country are implementing IPM programs. So this slide speaks to education. The more people are educated about pests and IPM, the more likely they are to do things to help prevent pests. Um, and the more likely they are to notice and report pest incidents. These are examples of some tools that can be used. Um, these are posters. Uh, could be any kind of handout, presentations at staff meetings, um, individual meetings with staff or administrators, um, especially if there's a reoccurring or particularly challenging pest problem. These are exa some examples of communication tools. You know, it might be a pest sighting log where staff can report pest sightings um, for the facilities manager or pest manager to respond to. The bed bug poster there is you know, kind of an education tool, but it's also communicating the steps that are going to be taken if bed bugs are um, suspected in the facility. So just getting everyone on the same page and encouraging that flow of communication around pest issues. As we move into some of the other um, parts of IPM, we'll definitely want to do um, an inspection. You know, routine inspections can help identify evidence of pests as well as conditions that might encourage them. We can also use um, tools such as sticky traps um, to help expedite inspections since you know, it can be time consuming, but um, tools like sticky traps can help um, when we're trying to quickly identify um, where pests are located. So as we're looking um, in our facility for pest conducive conditions, um, these are some photos of things that we might be looking for. So we can see there on the left, and uh, this is kind of a, a storage closet in the classroom. Uh, it's got a, quite a bit of clutter, uh, a bunch of paper products, um, and these types of environments can provide food and shelter for pests. You can see there on the right, and uh, they've eliminated some clutter. Um, there's less paper and cardboard. And something we definitely want to look for as well, um, sometimes things like seeds or Macaroni can be used in classrooms. Definitely want to make sure any kind of food products are stored properly um, so that we aren't feeding the pests that we're trying to get rid of. Here we've got kind of a storage area. Um, on the top there, you can see it's pretty cluttered. It would be difficult to know if we were having a pest problem. Um, because they could easily be hiding um, or taking shelter um, in this cluttered area. So on the bottom, uh, much more organized storage. Boxes are up off of the floor. And if you know, they continue to experience um, a problem with, for example, cockroaches, and they might even think about eliminating all of the cardboard, um, since cockroaches can often hitchhike into a facility in cardboard, and then they um, tend to feed on the glue that holds the corrugated cardboard together. But um, the second photo is definitely um, much more organized than the top one. Of course, waste basket um, or waste bins are an important, can be an important source of food for pests. Um, so you wanna use liners, uh, make sure they're empty daily. Um, and inspecting areas around trash to make sure that we're um, cleaning up any spills and not feeding pests overnight. Um, dumpsters can be um, another source of pest problems. On the top photo there, you can see the dumpsters and they're right up next to the building. It doesn't look like their lids are very tight fitting or in good repair. Whereas on the bottom photo, um, the dumpster is in much better repair, sitting on a hard surface. And ideally it would be 
at least 30 feet from the school building. Drains can be another source of pest issues since pests such as the drain fly um, pictured there on the bottom, um, as well as mosquitoes and cockroaches can thrive in stagnant drains. Um, so we wanna check the drains just to make sure that they're clean um, and free of organic matter. Um, that's where the, the drain flies breed is in the organic matter in the drains as well as we want to make sure that we have um, drain traps that are in good repair. So in this photo we can see, uh, this is Dr. Mark Lame. He's a national school IPM expert, but he is, uh, has removed a drain cover and he is um, cleaning the organic matter out of the drain. Moving to the outside of our facility, on the top again, uh, something else you'd want to keep an eye out for where um, the vegetation is right up next to the school building um, can create like a pest highway for um, different pests to get onto the building um, and perhaps find a way in from there. Here's the bottom photo and we can see that the, the mulch and the vegetation are at least 12 inches from the side of the school building. We also want to keep an eye out for entry points, um, places where pests might be getting into our building. So on the top, um, showing weep vents, which are important for brick structures and the pipe chase. The, the photo there is showing a, um, the size of a mouse relative to a penny. Um, but keep in mind that mice they can fit into any space um, that they can get their head through. Um, so their school is actually about the size of a pencil. Um, so any crack or crevice um, that you can stick a pencil into, it's likely that a mouse um, could actually get through that. And the smaller cracks um, as well, smaller pests such as ants, cockroaches, um, or even nesting pests like wasp um, could get in or create a nest in that environment. This is just showing um, how some of those different cracks and crevices are sealed up. Um, we've got our weep vents there. And um, it looks like they've used some kind of cement or something on um, this pipe chase, but there's different types of um, wall mounts, um, of course, that can be used to achieve the same result. Um, doors can also um, be a place of entry for more than just people. You can see the light kind of coming in um, from the bottom of that door, likely a sign that maybe the door sweep or the threshold needs to be replaced. Um, generally, you want to make sure that doors um, are sealed and closing properly to keep pests out. Sources of moisture, um, you know, just really preventing water that can attract pests. Not shown here, but um, another big one can be refrigerators or vending machines. Um, condensation can build up to be a source of water, um, as well as bathrooms, generally cleaning up spills and maintaining drains. And even custodial closets. Um, on the left there, um, you, know, you can kind of see a little bit cluttered. Um, and if the, the bucket or the mops aren't stored properly, um, they can maintain moisture um, versus on the right where the mops are propped up and drying. Um, and then finally to the top of our pyramid um, for pesticide use. So when we're using pesticides in schools, and we want to remember that using chemical products is never a substitution for um, the topics that we've been talking about so far, sanitation, exclusion, um, reducing clutter. When we do use products, uh, we want to opt for products that have less potential for exposure 
such as baits, gels, or crack and crevice treatments over products like liquid sprays, foggers, or volatile formulations. You know, during these presentations, especially when we were in person and getting to chat with folks, uh, we get to hear about some different practices. I've heard of things um, like folks setting off bug bombs in preschool classrooms for head lice, or uh, schools spraying children's backpacks or coats with insecticides for bed bugs. You know, unfortunately, those types of treatments just really aren't effective um, due to the nature of those pests, um, and also have a really high potential for exposure to children. So that's why we want to be a little bit thoughtful um, when we're selecting products in our treatment. Um, and then to the next point there, making sure to choose a product that is labeled for the specific site and pest that we are trying to control. Um, so really knowing the pest um, that we're dealing with and how we might best go about um, eliminating them in the school environment and doing that in the safest way possible. Um, and of course, always reading and following label directions. We always say the label is the law, um, and that is absolutely true. So if you keep any pesticides on site, um, just a couple of other things to keep an eye out for, making sure that uh, they are in a secure locked location. And sometimes we see where products will be stored in a, a storage room or a janitor's closet. Um, and the label will be peeling or illegible. Um, the containers might even be expired. Um, if you need information on disposal for old products, I would recommend contacting your state or local government. Um, those are typically the folks that handle disposal programs for getting rid of older products. And then, of course, on the bottom, um, sometimes teachers tend to um, keep products in classrooms, um, which is on this picture showing they're right next to the arts and crafts, um, not a very safe practice. And then in the time of, of COVID-19, um, just a couple of quick notes before I wrap up on um, antimicrobial pesticides, um, such as disinfectants. Um, disinfectant products are also um, considered antimicrobial pesticides um, and they're required to be EPA approved. Um, so when we're choosing products, we want to make sure that they have an EPA registration number on the label and that let us, lets us know that they're actually registered products. Again, reading and following the label directions, many disinfectants require that the surface be pre-cleaned and following the contact time on the, that's the amount of time that the surface needs to remain wet in order for the product to be effective. Often it's anywhere between, um, it'll say specific time will be listed on the label, but it's often anywhere from 30 seconds up to 10 minutes. And you wanna wear gloves and wash your hands. Um, and again, storing products out of reach of children. Disinfectants should not be used by children. EPA does have called List N for um, finding products that are specifically registered um, for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. I put a link um, to that list there um, in case folks wanted to check whether or not their products were registered for that virus. Um, as well as um, at that link, you'll also find this, um, I think is a pretty cool um, handout that not only addresses best practices for using um, disinfectant chemicals, but it also touches on um, things like fogging, electrostatic spraying, as well as UV lights and ozone generators. Um, so this picture is a little bit hard to read, um, but there's Definitely more, um, more information on that if you're curious um, at the EPA list and um, website where you can find this graphic and lots more information from there. 
Um, there's tons of resources out there. Um, you know, we didn't have a ton of time today, but if you're interested in IPM approaches for specific pests, um, those are out there online. Um, you can find them on our EPA website. We have a whole page dedicated to IPM where we also host um, periodic webinars. There's also the, the Pest Defense for Healthy Schools it has different training modules um, for different school staff, as well as you're also welcome to contact um, EPA Region 7 Pesticide Program with questions or your university extension office. Um, extension folks are a wealth of information on both pests and pesticides. I'd like to acknowledge these folks for their um, contributions to my presentation today. And with that, um, I will wrap up. Um, and I think we will take a couple of questions now. Um, and then if there's more questions that we haven't gotten to, um, there will be some time at the end where we can um, address some additional questions as well. So I'm going to stop sharing here um, in case folks have questions that we can address. Hey, Bethany, this is Mike. Currently, there are no questions in the Q&A. Perfect. That is great. Um, so in that case, feel free to submit questions. We'd be happy to take them at the end. And at this point, I will um, turn it over to Kara, who um, will lead us into the asbestos portion of our presentation today. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, for the invite. Thank you, Bethany, for reaching out to me. And it's it's great to have the opportunity to be able to talk to you all today. I am the um, AHERA Center for Excellence lead. And what that all means is doing what I'm doing now, reaching out to folks, providing compliance assistance, training. And we've I brought some speakers with me. Um, and John, you're going to be hearing from John. I like to call him the godfather of Ahara. <laughs> He's been doing this for quite some time. He has lots of pictures, a wealth of knowledge. And we also have um, your contact in your region, uh, which is Tyler. He is going to, he is your contact for Ahara as well. And so you'll be hearing from him. So without further ado, hopefully I can get this right. I'm going to pull up the presentation. All right. Okay. Um, and let's see here. John, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton to you. And at the end of your presentation, at the end of John's presentation, I will go over um, resources available to you as well. And like I said, you will also hear from Tyler. Um, throughout the presentation at the end. And um, if you have any questions, again, just as a reminder, put your questions in the Q&A and we'll cover your questions at the end of the presentation. John? Hey, thanks, Kara. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. And is the screen okay? Are you seeing the full view? Yes. Good, good. Okay, great. So uh, again, I'm John Pavitt. I work for EPA and I've been doing this since the uh, late 80s, I started in the Region 5 Chicago office uh, for EPA, so next door to Missouri. Um, and I've been, so I've been talking to contractors and building owners, going out doing inspections when asbestos is removed, checking on those contractors, going to landfills and looking at the, uh, the asbestos waste that gets pulled out of buildings, make sure it gets buried properly. So kind of looking at it through all the links in the chain uh, from start to finish. And so that has brought me to schools time and again. And um, I'm gonna share some of that experience today because this is a refresher. It's uh, by law, now we're talking about the HERA law, the, and this is a very well-named law. It, AHERA is the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act. So right there in the name, it, we're talking about asbestos. We're talking about a hazard. And sometimes you need an emergency response for it. 
that all affects every school K through 12 in the United States. Um, so I'm gonna provide some training along with Tyler and this is refresher and by law, there's five types of employees who need this training. And I would say everyone attending today also needs this training. But if you are a worker, a contractor, an inspector, a management planner, or a project designer, this federal law says you have to take a refresher. But uh, my understanding on this call today, we have folks who are uh, in one way or another responsible for maintaining buildings or supervising people who maintain buildings. And uh, so this will help raise awareness about where you find asbestos in a building and assessing its conditions. There's a lot we could say about this federal law. We're gonna, let's go ahead to the next slide, please, uh, Kara. We're gonna talk about this, uh, the inspections and surveillance. And for me as an EPA inspector, when I come out and checked on contractors who are pulling asbestos out of schools, um, you know, these are the, this is the most important type of activity from my view that happens at a school. We're talking about inspections of the building and surveillance of the building materials to make sure they're in good condition. Remember, I hear is all about preventing school kids from being exposed to asbestos. That's what it's all about. And it starts with knowing where it is in the building. This photo is of a school in Portland, Oregon. I inspected a couple of years ago and uh, they were getting ready to pull the uh, wipe erase board off a classroom. And we'll see a picture a little bit later on from a different room in that school where they pulled it off and there's lots of asbestos behind that board. And everybody knew it because they had a management plan. Okay, next slide. All right, so again, inspections and surveillance. This has been going on in school buildings since the early 1980s. President Ronald Reagan signed this law and has said every school K through 12 is gonna find out if they have asbestos in the buildings. Well, how do you do that? You inspect the building and you keep doing surveillance. And why do we do it? It's for everyone's safety, right? That's why these danger signs are posted. You know, let's pay attention to that word at the top of the sign, danger, right? That gets people's attention. It gets parents' attention if they come into your building and they see that sign posted. It gets uh, employees' attention if they're working in that building. They see that sign, danger, and they think, oh my God, I'm in danger. There's asbestos here. And then the next, next thing you know, they call EPA and they have a complaint and they say, my kids are gonna be exposed to asbestos. I'm really worried about them. And then it may cause an EPA person like myself to come out and check that building. So again, you know, just look at that sign, danger. There's a reason it says danger. It's because asbestos can be dangerous. And the other picture on this slide shows, you know, a hole in a wall someone needed to get to some pipes. Well, until you cut that hole in the wall, you don't know what's behind there exactly. So asbestos may be hidden from view, not easy to find. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so under this federal law, AHERA, certain types of materials must be inspected and it's asbestos containing building material. We define what that means. We list three things in this definition. These are the three things that must be inspected, K through 12. Surfacing asbestos containing material. The next one is thermal system insulation, right? So that's thermal system. That means it's insulation on a pipe, something to keep it hot or cold. And then for everything else, we call it miscellaneous uh, asbestos containing material. So that's the whole ball of wax there. If it's not on a surface, it's not on a pipe, it's miscellaneous. So the intent here is to have a broad definition 
of everything that has asbestos containing material in it, if it's in a building, interior structural members, or other parts of a building. Um, Bethany's presentation with the pesticides and integrated pest management, some of her photos were looking at outside like dumpsters up against a wall. Pretty much asbestos regulations are looking inside the building. Almost always it's inside. Uh, I think that was designed that way because that's where the kids are. You know, they're sitting in a classroom, they're sitting in the lunchroom, they're in the library. These are interior places where you'll find asbestos. And we're gonna see some pictures of that. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so what are these asbestos containing building materials? There's a lot of them. Historically, 3,500 materials are known to contain asbestos. Uh, they may still have asbestos. Most uses are not banned. Here's some common examples, pipe insulation, ceiling texture, roofing asphalt, floor tile, cement pipes. It's a long list. Uh, we're not gonna take all day to list them all. I wanna show you some examples. All right, so this first slide shows pipes with thermal system insulation. You have the straight parts and the elbows. So pipe runs and pipe elbows. Uh, the picture at left is from a hotel that was demolished and I inspected it. And down in the crawl space, there were sections of pipe with this paper-like material called air cell. And that had asbestos in it. They didn't find that before they tore the building down. Unfortunately, they did not have a survey. The, the other picture is an elbow. It's a different type of material. It's usually hand applied. Uh, so elbows and pipe runs are different and they can both have asbestos. The, these show very damaged material that could expose people. Next slide, cement board. So this would be uh, miscellaneous, right? Because a, a piece of cement often does not have surfacing on it, right? So it, this is that catch-all miscellaneous material. If you have cement panels <clears throat> on the inside, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be covered under a HERA. If it's outside, even if it's bad, like that, the cracked and broken, it's probably not covered under the HERA law. You would want to maintain that. Obviously, it's damaged. And when you find it, it's 20, 30, 40% asbestos in the cement. Okay, next slide. Uh, th these next two pictures are from a um, workshop. I inspected, they were getting ready to tear it down. And um, it was not a school, it was a commercial building. It's one of the places the EPA goes. They had overlooked the hooded vents, right? Hooded vents are around hot surfaces. So cement is fireproof. It's great, very durable. It's, you know, corrosion resistant, fireproof. But before they tear the building down, the EPA requires them to carefully remove those panels, set them aside, don't crush them, break them, generate dust. Again, we don't want to have people breathing asbestos dust. So I got there just in time and said, hey guys, did you test that stuff? They had not. And uh, so they carefully set it aside. They did test it and it came back positive. So we avoided a problem that day. All right, next slide. Uh, other examples, surfacing. So popcorn ceiling, that texture that's sprayed on the ceilings or put on the drywall, it could be some kind of texture. That's a surfacing material and it must be inspected. Okay, next slide. Drywall and joint compound, a classic. You find this everywhere and it still has asbestos in it. So you have to check the label Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. If you're buying new supplies, you know, so for your maintenance, maybe you have a program where you look at the incoming supplies and make sure you check the MSDS, the safety data sheet. 
to see if there's asbestos in that. Drywall and joint compound, historic classic use, it's almost always there. Next slide. So I said, check the label. Roofing material uh, often has asbestos in it, but modern times now, they have to label if it does. Let's take a look at this label. Okay, so hit the down arrow, Kara. Um, there's a couple of warnings on here. Warning cancer and the VOC content of the material, the mineral spirits, cellulose fiber, polymer, arrow down, uh, Kara, and there we go. There's a yellow circle around. Product is asbestos free. So this product, blackjack rubber seal, rubberized roofing and flashing cement, um, they've analyzed their product and they put the safety information on the label. So check those things on the incoming supplies so you don't uh, have, so you're not adding to the asbestos in the building. Now, of course, this is an outdoor material and usually the HERA law does not cover outdoor materials, but still why bring asbestos into your building and use it on things? Uh, you can avoid it. So look for the label. Next uh, see, uh, photo, here we go, gaskets. This would be a miscellaneous. So if there's a heating system, a heating plant, and I see we have plant managers on this call today, you know, gaskets are found in heating systems. And historically they're known to be manufactured with asbestos. So if there has been a survey, that means somebody goes out and inspects the building, uh, this is interior, and they should identify gaskets as asbestos unless proved otherwise. And you can prove it one way or the other with a lab test. Um, so if you have spare parts, you send one to a lab and they can test it and say yes or no, is there asbestos in that? Okay, next slide, uh, flooring material. So flooring material would be miscellaneous. It's not a surfacing uh, that's added on to something. So in this school I inspected, I got a call, one of those calls from a concerned parent. I'm sure you all get them if you're doing any kind of maintenance. Uh, and the parent said, oh my God, I saw a sign. It says danger. It's in the hallway by my kid's locker. Is my kid going to be exposed and, you know, are they going to get sick? Are they going to die? Uh, you know, I'm just paraphrasing here, but I've had this type of call many, many times with concerned parents. So I went on the other side of the wall. That, that wall is a temporary wall to isolate the work area. And I went in there to look at the workers. They were removing the mastic under the floor tile. The floor tile had asbestos, the mastic had asbestos, and they were using hand tools and a little driving cart, looks like a, almost like a little uh, a lawnmower you ride with, it. it has a steel blade across the front and it, as it drives across, it pushes on the floor tile and pops them up. So it's a, it's a tool used to remove floor tile. Sc old schools replace flooring, it happens all the time. So. A HERA says, inspect the building, determine if there's asbestos, and then have a management plan. So they, this school in Alaska had a plan. They knew there was asbestos there. So when they contracted the work, they contracted it as an asbestos removal project. Now there's something on the wall that's black as well. There used to be a chalkboard on that wall and there was mastic there. Mastic is a tar-like material. It's sticky. It, you know, it's an adhesive and it holds things on a wall, on a floor. Very often the mastic has asbestos in it. So these guys were using hand tools. Um, one other comment about this photo with the workers, they've got their sleeves rolled up. They're working hard. But you know, if a guy's wearing PPE to protect himself, those are not short sleeve Tyvek suits. Those are long sleeve Tyvek suits. So I guess they got hot and they rolled up their sleeves. If I was the supervisor, 
for the contractors, I would say, keep the sleeves rolled down. It's there to protect you. It should be from head to foot, total protection for the worker. Okay, next slide. Couple more examples, HVAC, right? So inside the air duct, there's sound dampeners because air ducts are loud. And in the HVAC system, there'll be filters that get pulled out. Uh, the photo at right comes from a shopping center I inspected in Alaska. It was a criminal settlement. And if anyone is interested in the case, I could send you the news clipping. Uh, the building owner um, pled guilty to intentionally violating uh, asbestos regulations. Um, the dumpster was full of uh, filters that were contaminated. So they were improperly handled. So the, my point is filters in the HVAC system can become contaminated, right? That material gets onto the filters. And the sound dampener inside uh, can also have asbestos in it. You could find that out by doing an inspection or doing surveillance. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's a term vocabulary from Mahira. We're talking about homogeneous areas. So in this picture, I'm, we're showing two kinds of flooring material, beige and green, and they're different, right? So they should each be sampled. Uh, if you have a sample of the beige tile and it comes back positive for asbestos, then in the AHERA management plan, it will say beige tile has asbestos. That's the same answer the whole building, unless testing proves otherwise. If it has that homogeneous appearance, and that means you know it appears similar, it's homogeneous, has a similar texture and look, you know, the test results are the same throughout the building. So you would sample the green as well as the brown or the person at your school district who does that, the designated person would make sure that you have samples of both because they're different. All right, next slide. Um, assessing condition. It's not enough to know where the asbestos is. Every school K through 12 must do an assessment, is it in good condition or damaged or significantly damaged, right? And that changes over time. You have wind storms, you have school bonds that pass and they say, we want to replace this aging boiler or the aging roof or the aging tile or pull up old carpet. Um, you know, conditions change over time. So under a HERA, a local education agency shall inspect each school building that they lease, own, or otherwise use as a school building to identify all locations of friable and non-friable. That's another vocabulary word. Friable means it can be crushed, crumbled, reduced to powder with hand pressure. So think of uh, you know, a handful of saltine crackers and you crumble them into a bowl of soup that is friable, you've just turned it into powder, dust, crumbled pieces, right? So that's friable. Or if you take a power saw, power drill, power uh, sander, you know, anything can be turned into dust if you get aggressive with it, right? So if it's, need to know if it's friable or non-friable, asbestos containing building material. And the inspector shall classify into one of the following Categories, is it damaged or significantly damaged? Thermal system insulation, surfacing material, miscellaneous material, uh, or is there a potential for damage, right? It may be in great condition today, but it's in a spot, well, it, you know, it has potential for damage or significant damage, right? So um, that is the task for the asbestos building inspector who comes to your facility. Where is it 
and what condition is it in? All right, next slide. So let's talk about what is friable material. The picture at left shows popcorn ceiling. It's a texture, it's a surfacing material on a ceiling and it's friable. If you could take your hand and crumble it in the pieces and powder comes out, that is friable. You'd wanna make a note of that. It doesn't mean that it's raining down on your head, but if you scrape it with a pencil or school kids throw a basketball at it and pieces come down, you know, it's friable material can come down. Uh, next slide. So here's a couple more examples. Um, photo at left is a stairway and there's a cement wall there. There's some surfacing material on it. It's a coating on the wall and it's flaking off. Okay, that's significantly damaged. The picture at right shows a wall and a ceiling. That's a drop ceiling. Um, that drop ceiling is in good condition, but there's potential for damage. And the material up above the drop ceiling, there's some, some kind of insulation on the wall. I don't remember exactly what that was, but you know, there's potential for damage there. Uh, and I'll, we'll have a, a picture in a moment that kind of explains why there's potential for damage up above a ceiling, like who's going above a ceiling? Nobody goes above the ceiling. Well, think about that for a minute. People do go above the ceiling, so there's potential for damage. All right, next picture, please. A couple more examples, assessing condition. The pipes at left are asbestos coated. That's thermal system insulation. They're labeled. They're in good condition. Uh, the photo at right is thermal system insulation that's significantly damaged, right? So you'd wanna know that. Next slide. Flooring, picture at left is a bathroom stall. There's a crack. Uh, there's some damage there, right? It's not brand new, there's some damage. Photo at right is a uh, housing. The heat was cut off. The windows were gone. There was freezing and thawing and water damage. Boy, is that significantly damaged. So in a school, you know, uh, uh, you may not have areas that where the heat shut off for a long time like that. You know, just for an illustration here, that is significantly damaged, no question about it. It is cracked and crumbling all on its own. Next slide. Here's two more very common asbestos containing materials in schools, and they usually are in good condition. Science labs, countertops, good condition, right? That doesn't mean someone's not gonna knock over a Bunsen burner and set it on fire or cut through it with a saw, maybe drill through it because they want to change the plumbing or something. You know, it can become damaged, but that's pretty solid there. And the sink undercoating, also in good condition, very common in schools. Next slide. Here's that blackboard or wipe erase board that's been removed. So if a asbestos building inspector comes to your facility, and they do a survey, they should be thinking about what is inaccessible, what is behind uh, the blackboard, you know, and they may just assume it is held onto the wall. They should account for it in the management plan and say there's a, you know, 15 foot long wipe erase board in room three, and uh, we're assuming the adhesive behind it is asbestos containing. Right, those black dots, if you see that, almost always there's asbestos in that glue. All right, next slide. So yeah, these black dots are mastic behind a blackboard. Um, again, the inspection process, if someone is inspecting or re-inspecting, they need to be a detective. They need to look deeper. They need to look for things that are not immediately obvious. So what's behind the outlet 
what is behind the light fixture, what's above the drop ceiling. They should be poking around and looking and uh, trying to peer into the cavities behind or the voids behind things. You know, what's behind there? Let's find out that is the task, what is in that school building K through 12. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so another classroom. And we talked a minute ago about what is above the drop ceiling. Like, is there a potential for disturbance? So what if the school bond passes and there's a budget for upgrading the internet? Okay, we're gonna get really good internet in this school building. Great, everybody wants high-speed Wi-Fi. Be wonderful. Contractors are going to be going up there. They're going to uh, remove that drop ceiling. Uh, there may be some spray on fireproofing up above that ceiling. So there's potential for disturbance. If there's a worker up there stringing his stuff across or maybe pulling out the old wires, there's potential for disturbance. So the school management plan should have already identified this room has a drop ceiling up above it, there's spray and fireproofing. And contractors can look at that and say, oh, okay, uh, now we know uh, when we get up there, there's gonna be asbestos and they could deal with it, right? They could do it safely. Uh, next slide, please. So potential, right? We're, you, you make a note in these, uh, asbestos management plans, is there a potential for disturbance? Well, air blowing through a duct causes erosion. It's very slow, right? But hey, talking 10, 20, it's been almost 40 years since a hero became a law. The first building inspection may have been like 1987. And now over time, maybe that's eroded inside there. So there's potential. You would make a note of it in the plan. Every, that way everybody knows what's there. And the same with floor tiles over time, cracks appear. Like maybe there was an earthquake, like in Alaska, we have earthquakes uh, more times than we could count and cracks show up in floors and walls and ceilings and foundations. Uh, or it could just be walking. Walking has potential for disturbance potential for damage. All right, next slide. So what are the deadlines? When do these things have to happen? Um, I mentioned the initial inspection may have been in the 1980s, but Ahira says you don't just do it once, you have to go back at least every three years after you have a management plan. The management plan lays out where all the stuff is, you know, is. Where's the asbestos and what's its condition? Then every three years, go back and recheck. Conduct a reinspection of all friable and non friable, known or assumed. All right, so let's look at those two words there known. How do you know something is asbestos? Um, that means a lab test was performed. A piece of that floor was sent to a lab. They looked at it with a microscope. They used the protocol, the right test protocol, and they determined, yes, there is asbestos in that floor tile. We know it. It's 1%, 5%, 10%. They'll give a number. Okay, that's known. Assumed, schools are allowed to assume that some materials are asbestos. That way, they don't have to test. Now, I mentioned the wipe erase board with the black dots. You don't want to pull the board off the wall to check the dots. You kind of mess up the room that way. You could assume it's there. or um, So assuming is fine as long as that's in your plan. And the plan says this texture on this one hallway, we're just assuming it's asbestos. Okay, that means you have to treat it as if it is, right? Assuming means we're going to manage it as if it is asbestos because we've assumed it. You could always go back, take a sample, bring it to a lab, and confirm, you know, it, did I assume right? Is that asbestos, yes or no? Uh, okay, so next slide. Every three years, the reinspection, right? So here's 
couple of pictures of some duct work and maybe in the past it was in very good condition. Has it become friable? You know, there's flexing on duct work. It goes on and off, on and off all day and night. Materials and there's, it gets hot and cold. Materials uh, can change over time, document the condition. So maybe three years ago it was non-friable, but this year it's friable. Right, it just time has caught up with it. Next slide. Reinspections and periodic surveillance. All right, so these this is phrasing from the Hero Law and the regulations that come from it. For each area of the school building, each person performing a reinspection shall visually reinspect. Right, that means they have to put their eyes on it, look at it, assess the condition. Is it, you know, is it still non-friable or did it become friable? And touch it, right? So this is a touchy-feely regulation. I freely admit it. You must touch the material to assess it. It's not enough to look at it. it the regulations literally say touch it because then you can tell, hey, is this stuff friable or not? So the idea is you go through, look at everything again, see if it's changed. Uh, bulk samples may be collected and submitted for analysis, right? So you could always get more data and further refine the plan. That's an option. Next slide. And then surveillance, we're talking about every six months. And I think we're, I'm probably pressing my time limit here. Uh, I think we're at the end, about the end of my presentation. So resurveillance, which is quick and easy every six months, uh, take a look at it again. Visually inspect, record the day of the surveillance. This is a less detailed observation than the, the one every three years. And then make you know make a record of it. Here's my contact info. I am in Alaska, and. Uh, uh, I cover four states for region 10, the Northwest states plus Alaska. So I'll stop there. That was really good, John. Um, I didn't, didn't see any questions pop up in the Q&A, but um, if people have questions, it's uh, still an option. I think my contact information is in the following slide, but these are useful resources. Yes. Uh, can you all hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, and I'll also, yes, I'm going to go to that contact slide and then we'll again open it back up for questions. I know we're crunched on time, so I'll, I'll just briefly let you know that everything that you heard um, John talk about, you can find it in these resources here. One really good resource is one that we just finished is the Ahara Designated Person video training webinar series. It's on YouTube. I highly encourage you um, to take a look at that. Um, there's a particular video there that talks about the health effects and um, just due to time, we weren't able to get into it, but it'll be helpful for you all to understand why, you know, the why behind all this. Asbestos is very serious and it's not something you wanna play around with. So um, it's designated person training, but it, everyone can learn from it. So highly encourage you all um, uh, to take a look at that. And then um, here we have the how to manage asbestos in school buildings, the study guide, which we use to base the webinar series on. And then um, as you heard him talk about, we have um, an asbestos management plan self audit checklist, as well as a model aspe um, AHERA asbestos management plan for LEA. So strongly encourage you to take a look at that as well as a fact sheet. Um, and then here's our contact information here. I'm going to leave that up. Um, Richard, I'm not sure, and Bethany, how much time we have, but it would take um, whatever time you need. Okay. We would like to open it up for questions for both Bethany and all of us. So um, if you could put those in the chat and we can definitely spend some time addressing those. Also, um, just want to make another plug for Tyler. He is your AHERA contact in Region 7. Um, so if you have questions even after this, there's his contact information uh, there. And again, I'd like to thank John um, 
like I said, for, for doing the presentation, just his expertise and pictures, it, they're so, so helpful. So appreciate that, John. At this time, I'll open it up for questions. Tyler, do you see anything new? It looks like uh, we just got a question that came in. I think it did get answered though. Um, John, did you answer that? Looks like John answered that. It says, uh, can the six month surveillance be done by a maintenance personnel or does it have to be done by an inspector? Um, we'll have to check and get back to the group on that one though. Right. So uh, about that maintenance uh, or the surveillance, uh, my suspicion is it has to be done by someone with uh, adequate training, right? Because they just may not know what to look at. And it may be over their head a little bit. They may miss a detail. Uh, but I want to double check the regulations uh, to make sure that training is required for that. Yeah, I think while we're waiting for, for questions to come in, um, just wanted to check and see, Richard, if you had any um, kind of closing notes or anything um, that you wanted to um, add for participants. I would be happy to. First, I'd like to thank Tyler, Bethany, John, Michael, and Caro for making their time available for us. The Missouri School Plant Manager Station takes pride in the certification program that we put together in 2013, 2014. Initially, we started out with about 52 people enrolled and we now have uh, approximately 325 people taking part in this certification program. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, professionalism and people in special uh, positions such as yourself to disseminate that information to help us because the people that have signed in show me and our organization that they are concerned about providing a safe, clean, and helpful learning environment. And it's information like this that makes us better stewards of our facilities that we're responsible for. And we thank you for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Um, Are there any more a, questions from the field? I see we have one other question um, that just came in. I'll turn it over to Tyler, maybe, if you wanted to yeah. read that one off. Um, the question is, uh, do you have to be qualified to do reinspections? Uh, general maintenance cannot perform the duty. Um, I think that's probably going to be the same, a similar question. Um, John, did you have a thought on that? Uh, hey, I'm looking at the uh, question now in the questions box. Uh, you have to, so this, Ralph says you have to be qualified to do reinspections. General maintenance cannot perform that duty. Uh, so reinspections are different than surveillance. And I think that first question was about the surveil at the every six month surveillance. That I would agree that reinspections must be done by a certified asbestos building inspector. That's a three day class uh, to get certified. The surveillance is something less rigorous, less detailed. Um, so I'm going to check the wording in the regulations to see about the surveillance. And I will also add the designated person training that I talked to, talk to you about. That's a video series on YouTube. Um, at the end of the training, it even talks about how you can create your own um, certificate. Again, it's up to the um, state to, to say that, that that is significant, that, that um, meets the requirements. Um, but we did tailor the training around the federal requirements. And so as it speaks to EPA, it covers um, the necessary information that you need. And we strongly encourage people to um, not only uh, watch the video, but become very familiar with the study guide.
Bethany, I'm going to assume that you have record of all persons signing in, which you can share with me. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We'll thank send you. that to you, Richard. All right, thank you. And with that, um, we're happy to hang on. Um, I know we have a few more minutes left in our time slot here. Um, we're happy to hang on if, if other folks have questions yet. Um, you can raise your hand um, or drop it in the chat. But I think we can say that this concludes our program for today. So if you don't have any questions, you're welcome to go ahead and jump off. But again, if you, if you do still have questions, um, we're happy to hang on for a couple more minutes as well. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Great job, John. I see that uh, our participants are signing off, but I want to say in closing to you as our special guest speakers, this, these two topics uh, often are very dry and hard to listen to. Uh, all of you have True. made it more pleasurable because I have sat in on every training session for the last eight years and for it to be, I'm keeping my eyes open and I'm keeping my thought process going while you're speaking speaks volume on uh, your background and your, and your ability to disseminate this information. So I appreciate that. Well, I like the way John incorporates pictures. <laughs> His slides are mostly pictures. And when it comes to talking about asbestos, I, I mean, you have to have the pictures and you, and you have to have the working experience that he has. So, uh, and, and Bethany, uh, I, I must say your presentation just made me shiver. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was really earlier. good. <laughs> yeah. The mice. Yeah. <laughs> The dumpster and, you know, the fact that a mouse could, if you could fit a pencil in there, then the mouse can get through. Yeah. It's just kind of startling, right? Yeah, Boy, can you get in the stuff. Yeah. I heard of a dime, but the pencil threw me. I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> These classes usually rotate about every three years, and I hope that I can call upon you all once again in the near future. Yes, well, this is what I do. So definitely uh, reach out to me. And John, you cannot retire. <laughs> so. Oh, darn. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pull back my paperwork. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Tyler, you, you'll have to brush up too. <laughs> yeah, John will have to give me a little bit of time to catch up. Yeah, here. yeah. Me too. Right, well, yeah, Richard. Uh -oh, Good go discussion, ahead. guys. I'm going to head out to the next meeting. Uh, good, good to work with you all today. Thank you, yeah. John. Great Thanks work with you, and look forward to getting the video link um, as well. So oh, great. Um, yeah. So thank you. All right. Till next time. All right. Bye bye.